60 years old. And they're seen widely as being problematic and not very well addressed. And effective tick management is poorly supported. So tick management is poorly supported despite the fact that we know of reputable methods of killing ticks out in the environment. And this could be an effective arm for prevention, tick control. So there are several methods known to be functional in killing ticks in the environment, which would likely reduce uh, exposure to tick bites, which is the, a, a primary cause of these tick-borne illnesses. And there are a few categories of these tick control methods. There are chemical sprays. These are typically either organophosphate, uh, insecticide, acaricides, or they are uh, synthetic pyrethroids. Those are all, every single one of them is very broad spectrum, so they have large non-target effects. They kill insects as well as ticks. They kill other arachnids like spiders, um, and they're toxic to vertebrates, um, some more than others. There are biocontrol sprays, so these are sprays typically in a water solution. Often there are, they are fungal spores in that water solution where the fungus is an entomopathogenic agent. Um, so those can be sprayed in an effort to kill ticks as well. They tend to be more specific, less broad spectrum, although that's poorly studied in general. Um, they are non-toxic in general, but they are also broadly less potent in most trials as compared to the chemical sprays. And then lastly, there are host-targeted means of killing ticks. Because of the tick life cycle, um, there are por critical portions in the life cycle of the tick when they are attached to a vertebrate host. And those vertebrate hosts can then be targeted with some kind of tick killing agent, which will be effective, in theory at least, in reducing the size of the tick population. These typically are chemical agents, but some of the problems with broadcast chemical acaricides or insecticides are not experienced when you target hosts because they are not broadcast out into the environment. So when there are trials of these tick killing agents that have been done um, quite um, frequently in recent decades, typically you can achieve reductions in tick numbers by at least 50% and sometimes by upwards of 90%. But these trials tend to be a very small spatial scale, typically less than a hectare as the unit over which you are applying the uh, tick control agent. There tend to be low levels of replication leading to poor uh, ability to in draw statistical inference. There are design flaws in these studies that I'll refer to toward the end of the talk. And it is the case that whether these reductions in ticks of at least 50% or sometimes upwards of 90% affect cases of tick-borne disease at all, because those questions simply are not asked in the vast majority of these studies. So we're left with this unanswered question, or the tick project um, addressed this unanswered question, does killing ticks actually protect us? We're not so interested in reducing tick populations to reduce the nuisance. Unlike mosquito control, um, where really the goal is nuisance reduction, in the case of ticks, yes, they're a nuisance, but we're really mostly concerned with pathogen transmission and the diseases that result, not simply reducing the ick factor. At least I don't care about the ick factor. So there was one large, well-replicated, and well-controlled study published in 2016 in the Journal of Infectious Diseases led by Allison Hinckley, who is one of the collaborators in the Tick Project. Um, and this study used a number of different individual properties, residential properties in Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland. There were about 1,000 of them. Um, and they sprayed bifenthrin, which is a synthetic pyrethroid. It's the, the drug of choice, if you will, for many of the pest control companies in the Northeast to control ticks in your yard. They achieved a reduction in tick populations of about 60% as compared to controls that did not get bifenthrin spray. Um, but they achieved no effect on in reducing um, 
the, on, of that reduced tick abundance, 60% reduction in tick populations, no effect on incidence of tick-borne disease in those resident populations. And the question became, well, why was that the case? These poor investigators were um, criticized rather vigorously by members of the public who wanted it to work and saw no reason why it shouldn't work. And they were questioning why this rigorous spraying of bifenthrin, which is, seems like the only option for many people, it didn't work. It didn't protect human health. So some of the ideas for why that study did not actually reduce cases of any tick-borne disease in those study populations was that they used one tick control method. Perhaps it was the wrong one, or perhaps using more than one would have helped. Their study extended one to two years, so they sprayed either in only one year or two consecutive years and followed tick populations and human health for only the subsequent year or two. They treated individual properties one at a time, whereas all the neighbors tended not to have any treatment in their properties. So perhaps people get exposed to that tick that made them sick somewhere outside of their own property. So they were treating the wrong places. So these are possibilities. So this, their study, Hinckley et al. study, was the point of departure for the tick project. Um, so they used one tick control method, as I just said. Well, we used two, and I'll describe what they, what they were in just a minute. Their study extended one to two years. Ours went for five. They treated individual properties. We treated neighborhoods. Um, and I'll describe what we mean by that in just a moment as well. So to select the two interventions that I just mentioned we used, we had a couple of important criteria. One was that they needed to already have been shown in these field trials, generally small scale, low replication field trials, to do a good job. Did they actually kill ticks? Do they reduce tick abundance? They needed to be commercially available because we didn't want to have a study that perhaps would show great efficacy in controlling ticks and reducing tick-borne disease, but not have anyone able to use it because they were not available products. Um, and they needed to be safe for people, for pets, and for the environment. So what were our two interventions? One of them was an entomopathogenic fungus called Metarhizium bruneum, formerly Metarhizium anisoplii. This is a microscopic fungus that occurs naturally in forest soils of um, the eastern U.S. and in other places as well, very poorly studied in nature. Um, this is a fungus that makes its living by attacking and killing arthropods on the forest floor, digesting them and using them as a food source. There, and this is what some of those attacked creatures look like. The, the fungus creates a mycelium that is grayish and columnar and basically digests the tick or the tick egg, as in the case of the left-hand um, photo, uh, killing those victims. There is a strain of Metarhizium bruneum, the F52 strain. It's a naturally occurring strain, not a genetically engineered one, that has been found to be particularly effective against ticks. And Ilya Fishhoff led a study as part of the tick project early on that asked about non-target effects which were quite minimal. It attacked black-legged ticks and few other creatures uh, in, in soil or leaf litter uh, communities. It has been commercialized into a product called MET52. Um, it's a sp and you make a solution of the spores of this entomopathogenic fungus and spray it in your target area with a high-pressure truck-mounted sprayer. The other device was a small box, which was called TCS, that stands for Tick Control System, very clever. Um, bait box, which is a plastic box, we covered ours with a steel shroud to keep varmints from damaging them. There are a couple of holes in the side of this box and a bait source in the middle. To get to the bait, a small mammal, which is attracted to those holes in the side of the box anyway, even without bait actually, um, to get to the bait, though, they have to pass by a little wick that applies a small drop of a chemical insecticide, a caricide, called fipronil, which is the active ingredient in frontline. So highly non-toxic, very safe for vertebrate animals, very lethal for ticks, um, 
And this shows the, the mean number in the tick project where you place these devices, we had about five and a half per property. So why would we want to target the ticks that occur on small mammals with one of our devices? Um, this is based on the life cycle of the tick. Sorry, this is the obligatory tick life cycle slide, which I feel compelled to show every audience. Um, what's going on here is that every generation of black-legged ticks and any other hard tick hatches from eggs into the larval stage where this stage is uninfected and not dangerous. So they may bite us, but they will not transmit any pathogens or make us sick. What the life stage that does make us sick is the nymphal stage, which comes out roughly a year later. To get from the larval to the nymphal stage, those larvae have to feed. They take one blood meal. They have to feed on a vertebrate host that allows them to survive to the nymphal stage. And if they're going to become dangerous, that vertebrate host has to infect them with a tick-borne pathogen. And this is where these small mammals come in. The way this looks is that this, this cohort of larval ticks hatches out. They are very generalized in their choice of hosts. They'll feed on anything on the ground with feather or furs, fur or feathers. Um, and what will determine our subsequent risk of exposure is how many of those larval ticks survive their attempt to feed on the host and how many of them get infected, as represented here, by the smaller number of nymphs than there were larvae to begin with, and the red color suggesting the infection of those hosts. So we've done extensive studies here at the Cary Institute, Felicia and I and other collaborators over the years, and we've determined that small mammals are by far more competent as reservoirs, more efficient at transferring, at transmitting an infection to those feeding larval ticks. So here are these small mammals over here. These are shrews, chipmunks, and mice. What we find is that this is for Borrelia burgdorferi, the Lyme disease agent. 92% of the larval ticks that take their blood meal from a free-ranging, wild, Millbrook, white-footed mouse acquire infection with the Lyme disease agent, molt into an infected nymph capable of making us sick. And that is a far higher rate than is the case for these larger mammals or, or deer, like opossums, raccoons, deer that infect a tiny fraction. They're very poor in infecting ticks with Lyme. We also know that mice are the most permissive host, contributing to the greatest probability of survival as compared to many other hosts. This is, again, done experimentally in the lab, where we find that the white-footed mouse supports about 50% survival of the larval ticks that try to feed on it, and that's vastly higher than for any of these other hosts. So by targeting the ticks that feed on small mammals, we're mo most likely to kill the ones that do well, survive to the next stage, and the ones that acquire infection and become dangerous. So we chose as our study site where we live and work and recreate, which is Dutchess County um, here in New York. And we started by assessing where in the county risk of Lyme disease, cumulative cases of Lyme disease, had been the greatest. We wanted to deploy tick control where the problem is the greatest, not where it was most convenient or some other criterion. So we chose neighborhoods within Dutchess County from the red, orange, and dark yellow zone here, where incidence rates of Lyme disease were the highest. Our neighborhoods looked roughly like this. This is a, an example of a neighborhood where they consist of roughly 100 adjacent homes and properties, fairly mod moderate to high density residential areas within the county. That happens to be where incidence rates of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases were the highest. And they were separated more or less from other neighborhoods um, that were adjacent. Initially, we identified 50 of those reddish, orangish, and dark yellowish uh, high-risk neighborhoods for recruiting the participants because we needed them to agree to work with us for five years. We prioritized the top 24 because of our design, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, and we began enrolling, which was an enormous task, bigger than we had ever expected it would be. 
We monitor our progress very carefully to determine when we could stop enrolling and get to the nitty gritty of the project. And I want to show you a little bit about what this looks like, what monitoring looked like. This is actually 26 neighborhoods on the x-axis, not 24. And it shows that we were able to resolve, we, we, content, we had to get the contact information for every household in these neighborhoods, or as many as we could get, and then start contacting them. Over here on the left, we see that we were able to enroll about half of the neighborhoods in the, uh, sorry, half of the, the properties in the neighborhood, and then we were able to resolve that another quarter or so weren't interested in participating fully. The rest, we couldn't contact at all. But there were some over here on the right where we had great difficulty contacting them at all or when we did enrolling them for reasons that we don't entirely understand. So we had to ditch um, four of those neighborhoods and start over to get two others so that we could get 24 neighborhoods with a criterion level of participation by the households within that neighborhood that we established a priori. So we ended up with 24 neighborhoods, all in Dutchess County. The average was 34% of the properties within that neighborhood participating, with the range being 24% to 44%. We started off with roughly 1,000 households, all together with roughly 3,000 people and their outdoor pets. Those were all our study subjects in this project. Our design looked like this. So we had our 24 neighborhoods. We had six replicates of each of four treatment types, treatment levels. So we had six neighborhoods in which we had active bait boxes. So these are bait boxes that had fipronil inside. And six, and, and they had placebo MET-52 spray. So this was water spray from a truck-mounted high-pressure sprayer, otherwise unmarked, unknown to anyone whether, it was, whether they had MET-52 spores in it or not. It was a placebo water spray. We had six replicates in which um, there were placebo bait boxes, so these were otherwise completely identical to regular bait boxes, but they lacked fipronil inside. But they had active MET-52 spray, so they had actual spores of the, of the fungus in the spray that was on these people's properties. We had six replicate neighborhoods where there were active bait boxes and active MET-52 spray. And we had six replicates where there were placebo bait boxes and placebo MET-52 spray. So we're going around, we hired a pest control company, we're going all over Dutchess County and we're spraying and we're deploying and removing bait boxes a couple times every season and we're gonna do this for five years. What data are we collecting once we've deployed these tick control methods? Well, the most important variable that we were interested in were cases of tick-borne disease and encounters of residents with ticks. So we pestered these people mercilessly every two weeks, almost all year long, for five years. We did so by telephone, if that's what they wanted. We preferred to do it by text or email. We did it however they would prefer. And we asked them whether anyone in the household had experienced a diagnosed case of a tick-borne disease in the prior two weeks or had encountered a tick in the prior two weeks. If they said no, we left them alone for two weeks and bugged them again. If they said yes, they were directed to take a follow-up survey. If they said yes, we asked them for permission via informed consent to contact their health care provider to get um, a, a surveillance uh, to actually confirm that that self-reported case was an actual case. And then we sent crack teams of researchers that we hired every spring um, to collect ticks on mammals and in the environment um, to estimate tick abundance. And the people liked us very much because we also, every nymphal tick that we collected on their properties or in their neighborhoods got brought back to the Cary Institute for assessment um, in the lab by Sahar, who's in the audience today, uh, for infection with three tick-borne pathogens, the ones that I mentioned earlier. So I want to show you a little bit about how we maintained um, our data flow 
uh, and how we managed it. So we had a lot of information from a lot of households um, in, a, in a lot of different sectors, and we managed it using Salesforce software. So this shows you what some of our records looked like. Um, Mark Benioff was actually not one of our participants. He's the CEO of Salesforce, who loves to have his name on slides. Um, but we had to keep track of their contact detail information, um, who they were, how we get in, in touch with them, any communications restrictions. We needed information on what surveys they had taken, whether they were eligible to participate in the study. We had strict criteria whether they had provided us with um, consent, informed consent, to pester them, to ask for their medical records and the like. They needed to take an introductory survey uh, for which we c collected a lot of very important information. Um, they needed to agree that we were going to deploy, maybe going to deploy tick control methods on their property, or maybe they were just gonna get a placebo and nothing would be deployed actually, and then we needed to keep track of these bi-weekly and case surveys. So this shows just one example of a particular participant household where down here we see that um, one of these bi-weekly surveys, there were no ticks, no cases, second one the same thing. Here they recorded a yes, they were sent to a follow-up survey uh, to determine whether what kind of, what, whether it was an encounter with a tick or a case of tick-borne disease, whether we could then contact their healthcare provider. They had no ticks, and here they didn't respond. So, but we had an extraordinarily high response rate to these biweekly surveys, despite how annoying they must have been. We also had issues with confidentiality um, and masking, also called blinding. Um, we were working with private information, we were working with healthcare information, we were working with um, human subjects and needed IRB as well as Animal Care and Use Committee approvals. So I'm just showing here that we have various different categories of employees on the project, including the project directors, Felicia and me. We had access to all the information, but we didn't actually look at it until the project was complete. But various other categories, we had a public liaison, data specialist, field personnel, phone survey personnel, et cetera. They were masked to everything that they needed to be masked to to maintain our data integrity in this project. We also had interesting and important interactions in terms of community relations. The, the success of the project depended on having the cooperation of a lot of people who we were annoying a lot um, by bugging them so frequently. And we took it upon ourselves. I, I, I use the broad we because this has to do with social media about which I know nothing. So the rest of the program took it upon themselves to maintain important community relations um, so that we would have cooperation and be seen as welcome participants in their lives rather than unwelcome. And I just show a couple of things here from social media posts um, this one here shows, um, describes a situation in which, as we were pu uh, publicizing the Tick Project, there were people living in parts of the county that were not in our 24 high-risk neighborhoods who wanted to participate. And there was this couple in Pleasant Valley. We did not choose a neighborhood in Pleasant Valley. They wanted to be involved, but instead of being disgruntled, um, they sent us an invitation. They said, as you travel around the region, please know that a warm welcome and a cup of coffee or tea await you at their address. In this situation, we had one of our um, project assistants who was enrolling participants very uh, actively throughout uh, spring and summer. Um, she had just enrolled a household in one of our neighborhoods, just gotten off the phone with the members of that household and dialed up the next household on her list, uh, which happened to be the next door neighbor. And between the time she hung up and dialed the next door neighbor, this, the just enrolled household person had gone next door and said, I just enrolled in this project. You should too, if they call you. We were very pleased about that. And then this is, I don't even know what social media this is. It reveals my ignorance. Is this Facebook? I don't know. Um, so. So one of our participants said, I know this much, 
since the tick project set up these animal car washes, zero ticks on my cat uh, and self. And I think this is Felicia's term uh, in some publicity. She referred to the bait boxes as animal car washes. And then lastly, um, we got a, a, a photo that was sent to us by one of our human participants um, of one of our non-human participants who is watching over one of our bait boxes, which is a little troubling, because if you're a mouse, you're not going to go in there. Um, but hopefully the cat didn't spend 24-7 sitting next to that bait box. Okay, so how about some results? Okay, so first I'm going to talk about ticks on rodents. Now this variable doesn't directly relate to our risk of exposure to tick-borne disease because these ticks have already found a host. They are not themselves directly dangerous to us, but it's an indicator of how ticky a particular property or a neighborhood might be. So we sent these teams out trapping small mammals on a regular basis, live trapping them, and counting ticks um, on their, their bodies. And it's not so difficult to count ticks on the body of a squirming, writhing small mammal that you've got by the scruff of the neck. All those little dark bumps on the ear of that mouse are engorging larval ticks. This was taken by Jesse Brunner uh, here at the Cary Institute years ago. So we're going to look at the number of ticks on small rodents, this is mice and chipmunks, in each of our treatment types. So where in our control sites where neither treatment was active, we had on average about five, a little over five ticks per animal host, mice and chipmunks combined. That's in the six replicate neighborhoods that were treated with um, placebo controls. In neighborhoods that were treated with bait boxes, that was reduced by more than half. In neighborhoods treated with active MET-52, there was a much more modest effect, statistically non-significant effect. And in neighborhoods treated with both treatments active, we saw, again, about a 50%, slightly more than 50% reduction in tick burdens on small mammals. Um, but interestingly, no additive effect of the bait box and the MET-52, as we'll see again and again. So we conclude that there were fewer ticks on mice and chipmunks on properties in neighborhoods that had been treated with active bait boxes with no significant effect of MET-52. We also sent teams out into the field to sample for ticks using timed tick drags or tick flags. Um, and this actually is a picture of a team from the Cary Institute. I believe that's Liz right there, maybe, from the back. Uh, that's Kelly, um, who are not part of the tick project, but the, the methods were extremely similar in this case. And we looked at tick abundance. These are the questing ticks, those out in the environment looking for a host uh, in, in multiple different habitat types. I'll show you the data for forests and lawns. So again, looking at the impact of these different treatment groups on the abundance of nymphal ticks, this is per timed interval spent flagging for these ticks. On control sites, there were about um, 0.3 ticks per timed interval. That's just for a, a relative measure for our purposes. It is not a density per se. And that was considerably higher than was the case for any of these neighborhoods in which there were interventions that were live. So bait boxes reduced the tick abundance per interval by about half, a little more than half, uh, as was the case with both treatments together. Again, no additive effect that we could detect between the two uh, interventions. And similarly for lawn, um, the results were quite parallel. Um, the abundance of ticks was about an order of magnitude lower in the lawn than in the forest. That is a um, common observation that we've made before. And when you look at the impact of bait boxes, MET-52 and both, you see a, a exactly parallel impact with a reduction by about 50% using bait boxes and both, and a more modest impact of MET-52 with no sign of an additive impact. So we conclude from this that there were fewer questing ticks in neighborhoods that were treated with active bait boxes. 
We looked very carefully at nymphal infection prevalence. Again, this is Sahar working in the molecular lab here at the Cary Institute. She crushed and analyzed using qPCR 5,380 nymphal ticks, kept her busy for, for quite a while over um, four different years. Um, and what we found was that the, the overall proportion of nymphs that were infected, this is with Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent that causes Lyme disease, was roughly 30% um, across all our different treatment types. This was for 2017, which is before we expected to see an impact of the interventions. This was the first year in which the interventions went out. So it was a sort of a pre-impact assessment. 30% is very much what we would expect for Borrelia. And what we found is shown here over the course of the following several years. We were unable to sample ticks in 2020 due to the recency of the COVID uh, emergence. Uh, although all of the interventions pr proceeded apace, even in 2020, in all years of the study. What we did find, if you look at the yellow bars, that's MET52, as time went on, we saw a reduced nymphal infection prevalence in neighborhoods with active MET52. It looked like there was a decline in nymphal infection prevalence through time, although that was not significant at the 0.05 level, but close. And there was no effect of either treatment on infection prevalence with either Babesia microti or Anaplasma phagocytophilum. We also looked at, uh, more recently at nymphal co-infection. So co-infection of an individual tick with multiple tick-borne pathogens is a big issue, um, particularly for healthcare providers, because if a human patient is infected by more than one pathogen at the same time, often from a single tick bite, that makes both diagnosis and treatment very problematic and outcomes can be um, grim compared to only a single uh, exposure, which is much easier to detect and to treat. So we were interested in what impact these, um, uh, these interventions might have on co-infection patterns in nymph stage ticks. We had found during previous work by Felicia's and my um, former postdoc, Michelle Hirsch, led by her with many other collaborators, uh, the title of this paper says it all, that we found that co-infection of black-legged ticks with two of those pathogens, Babesia and Borrelia, is higher than expected based on rates of transmission that you would expect with a null expectation of independent transmission rates of those two pathogens. They're not independent. It's higher than expected, and it comes from small mammal hosts. So the small mammal hosts, this is the co-infection prevalence on the y-axis, and the small mammals are the ones here in the left-hand panel A, and basically the purple ones are the Borrelia babesia co-infections, where the vast majority of those co-infections come from are white-footed mice, P. leucopus, and eastern chipmunks, Tamia striatus. So we hypothesized, based on this prior work, that killing larval ticks that feed on small mammals should reduce co-infection rates of questing nymphal ticks with these two pathogens, because the questing nymphs that are left in the environment um, were more likely to have fed on something else that doesn't co-infect them. And cutting to the chase inside this red oval, I'm showing the results for Babesia and Borrelia co-infections, where the bait boxes resulted in a vastly lower co-infection rate as compared to the controls, um, or either MET52 or both combined. So we conclude that co-infection of questing nymphal ticks with both Babesia and Borrelia was reduced by bait boxes which actively target the ticks that are feeding on small mammals, which produce the co-infected ticks. Okay, so let's look at cases of tick-borne disease as our most emphasized outcome of the study. And this is, these are cases of tick-borne disease in pets. In the controls, in the control neighborhoods, we saw roughly a cumulative five uh, cases of reported tick-borne disease in pets in the control sites. And if we look at 
um, reported cases of tick-borne disease across the other treatment types, we see a significant reduction based on both bait boxes and MET52 and both together, although once again, no sign of an additive effect of the two tick control interventions. So statistically, we can conclude that there were fewer cases of, of tick-borne disease in pets in the neighborhoods that received both active treatments, any active treatment. What about for humans? So for humans, the cumulative number of report, self-reported cases of tick-borne disease was a little higher than it was for outdoor pets, at a little over five. And when we compare what happened in controls with what happened in any of the treatments, we find that there was no impact of either of the treatments or both of them together on cases of tick-borne disease um, in the human populations. The active treatments made no difference in the number of tick-borne disease cases in people. So what have we learned and where are we going? So this is basically a summary slide because I threw a lot of information at you. Uh, in neighborhoods with active bait boxes, there were half as many ticks as in, in yards. In neighborhoods with active MET52, we saw more modest effects on tick numbers, but nymphal infection prevalence was significantly reduced. In neighborhoods with active bait boxes, we saw reduced co-infection of questing nymphs with Borrelia burgdorferi and Babesia microti. Reducing ticks in people's yards in these neighborhoods reduced the number of cases of tick-borne disease in pets, but reducing ticks in people's yards did not reduce the number of cases of tick-borne disease or their likelihood of reporting encounters with ticks. These data I did not show you. Um, so the, the interventions were not successful in impacting human epidemiology when it came to tick-borne illness. There are important lessons for study design for uh, work like this and related studies. Um, and to, to get at these lessons, Felicia and I reviewed uh, the tick control literature in Eastern North America. And we were able to quantify, based on that literature, 25 different effect sizes where people went out and attempted to control tick populations um, using some kind of a caricidal treatment. There were 25 effect sizes from 19 different studies. Of those 25 effect sizes, 21 did not include placebo controls, masking, also called blinding, or randomization. Um, and of the four that did, two of them were ours, and the other two were by our collaborator, Allison Hinckley, and, and her co-workers at the CDC. We asked about whether there was a difference in the conclusions that were drawn whether you did or did not include these safeguards in your experimental design. So here we have the mean effect size when Placebo controls, masking, and randomization of treatments were not used. So that's the no bars. So here are the, the response variable is the abundance of host-seeking nymphs only. That's part B. Part A is all response variables. So this, this could be other life stages of ticks. They could be host-seeking. They could be attached. Could be infection prevalence. It could even be um, human uh, outcomes, disease outcomes, or encounters with ticks. In general, there was at least a 75% effect size when you don't include these experimental design safeguards. But if you do, you see a plunge in the effect size. So when you're just looking at nymphs alone, that effect size on average is reduced by more than half. And it plunges even further when you're including all response variables, which can include epidemiologic ones as well as acrological or entomological ones. So placebo controls, masking, and randomization are used in order to avoid the creeping in of implicit bias by researchers into experimental design. And we think that when we're looking forward, Experimental designs really should include those safeguards whenever possible to avoid the, the effects of implicit bias by investigators. 
There's a lot of interest in finding new uh, methods of controlling ticks. It's a very active area of research. That's great. We approve. We encourage this. But finding new safe, we put in parentheses, safe ways of killing ticks, we don't want to nuke everything out there, uh, is important. But in our opinion, it's insufficient. These efforts to develop and test new tick killing products should include epidemiologic and public health outcomes whenever possible. Again, we're not out to reduce the nuisance of ticks as much as we're out to actually protect human health by controlling tick populations. If we are successful at controlling ticks but not at protecting human health, we need to rethink what it is we're trying to do. Inclusion of human subjects, masking, Controls, placebo controls are very expensive. They're expensive in, when it comes to dollars. They're expensive when it comes to time and effort, um, to say the least. So therefore, funding levels need to be high to be able to pay for this higher quality of research. So we're sort of left with uncomfortable questions, at least to me they're uncomfortable. If yard treatments are unlikely to reduce the incidence of tick-borne disease, what's left? One thing is we need to do a better job of determining where t people encounter the ticks that made them sick. Um, there is conventional wisdom that Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases are encountered, uh, are, are paradomestic diseases. That's a nice term by epidemiologists. That means people contract the disease by being around their homes. The actual evidence for that is uh, slim. Um, and we thought that perhaps uh, Elsewhere, outside of their properties, but within their neighborhoods, might be another place where people get exposed, and it might, in fact. But there are other places where people might encounter ticks when they're recreating outside their neighborhoods entirely. We need to do a better job of figuring out where those places are and what people are doing when they confront that tick that makes them sick. There's one thing that we know with reasonable um, confidence, and Ilya Fishhoff, again, a postdoc with the Tick Project, um, conducted a meta-analysis to ask about this more broadly. There is evidence that personal protection does have an impact. It varies, sometimes is modest, but by and large it does have an impact to use um, repellents, to use protective clothing, and to conduct tick checks and to know where and when you're most at risk of encountering a tick that might make you sick. So we can do a much better job in many cases especially newly invaded parts of the country where uh, knowledge levels are very low. We, I think, need to invest in research on vaccines against tick bites. There is a, a Lyme disease vaccine that's now in late stage clinical trials that will probably be successful and be marketed and it will protect people against Lyme disease. But there's the potential for those who are vaccinated against Lyme to have a false sense of safety and security. Um, that vaccine against Lyme will not protect them from any of these other rapidly increasing tick-borne infections. And the perverse outcome could be higher rates of babesiosis and anaplasmosis. Um, some of us have their own innate immunity to tick bites. I would be one. Uh, and there is interest in vaccines that target salivary antigens in the ticks that actually kill the ticks themselves before they're able to transmit pathogens. And that, I think, is a very promising area for future research. And then, of course, we need to do a better job um, with post-exposure outcomes when it comes to figuring out who does and who doesn't have one of these tick-borne diseases and then how to treat them. We're still using 50-year-old technology in both these cases. And I guess I would just like to point out in, in beginning to close here that um, ecology does play a role. Ecologists can play a role in many of these things, but other disciplines are really critically important here as well. And we should recognize that as ecologists who want to be involved in this, that you know, human behavioral biology and, and um, social science is important. Education is critically important. Um, vaccinology and immunology is important as well as um, medical practice uh, all, in all cases, ecologists can play a role, but presumably more of a collaborative role than a central role, at least for these future directions. So I want to give a few acknowledgments. I'll, I'll do this quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. 
Um, this was a huge project. We have a lot of people um, for whom we are deeply indebted, and this will not do justice, but I'm gonna go through a few of these. Um, we had these crack teams of, of project assistants every summer who had to wear these white suits. These are thick cotton white suits, and they're out in Dutchess County in July and August, sweltering with these things, and despite all that, they are smiling. Um, well, there's one exception to the smile, um, and I just wanted to point out that maybe she was aware that every year that there's a survey of the worst jobs in the biological sciences, tick dragging comes out well within the top 10. Um, so they're putting up with a lot to go out and subject themselves to the elements and to, to ticks with their white suits. Um, every year they smiled. We had um, amazing people in addition to those project assistants. I won't go through all the names. It'll take too long, but um, there they are. Uh, there were critical personnel who were employees of the Cary Institute as well as CDC and the Dutchess County Department of Behavioral and Community Health. We are in indebted deeply and forever to our large number of human participants and their pets, although it's hard to communicate that to them. Um, the funding for the project came by and large from the uh, Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation, but there were many other donors of uh, resources of various kinds, including in-kind help. There were many people at the Cary Institute who um, turned themselves inside out to help us get this project done, as well as at Bard College, and then several other people um, at Pestec, which was the company that deployed the interventions, as well as a bunch of other local people that um, I'm sure I've left others out, and for that I apologize. And with that, I will end and take questions in the final seven or eight minutes. Um, so, Nothing here. Okay, so it's all going to be in the room, so thank God I don't have to repeat the questions. I can't do that. So, Denise, your arm went up first. Well, I was curious about the pets. Were, were they prohibited from taking any kind of um, prevention medications? And did you count that into the results? The pets were not prohibited. We, we wouldn't do such a thing. Um, that wouldn't be ethical of us. We didn't prevent anyone from doing anything. We, if people used aggressive tick control on their property and wanted to continue to do so, we couldn't enroll them in the project. But we didn't try to convince anyone to do, to relax their vigilance in any way. So the, the potential for a lot of these outdoor pets to have had some kind of owner controlled um, tick-borne prevention was uh, certainly a, a possibility. It seemed like many would. And it seemed as though that would reduce our power to detect an impact of these yard treatments, these neighborhood treatments. Nevertheless, we found one. So um, the, the MET-52 and the bait boxes were able to protect the, the health of these outdoor pets, even when they were also having you know, their various collars and flea and tick treatments and being checked or not checked by the owner. So that would have been a source of noise in our data, but we had a signal despite it. So, but, so the normal say that you had three treatments potentially for the pets, the, um, the two that you applied and one the pet had, and would, could that possibly enhance their protection versus like the moon showed no Right, yeah, I see what you're saying. So I think that it would have worked in the other way, in the other direction. So if there were already, um, you know, we don't wear tick collars generally. It's not uh, generally advised for people to do that. Um, so if the pets were variably being treated f to prevent tick bites, that would have been a bigger noise um, source than would be the case for the human participants, and I would have expected our ability to pick up a signal to be lower, yet we picked up a signal for pets. I'm going to go to Alan. Oh. Oh, I don't have my excuse to 
Yeah, well, I presume I don't need to for that first one, but I will try to from this point forward. So the question was about um, the low sample sizes of both pets and people who got cases of tick-borne disease and whether that led to difficulties with the statistical power to detect an impact. Um, we did conduct very thorough power analyses before we designed the study um, to make sure that we could have reasonable statistical power to detect an, an expected effect size given an expected amount of variability um, and that sample size. Um, and, and it passed muster, but there were assumptions that went into it, of course, as always is the case for doing power analyses. Um, you're right that there was a very low cumulative number of cases in both pets and in people. It was similar, but it was actually lower in pets. So we were encouraged that our lack of detection of an effect of the interventions in humans was not a statistical power issue because for pets we did detect a significant effect despite the fact that the absolute number of cases was lower than it was for humans. I would also say that um, even though there was a low cumulative number of cases uh, in each of these neighborhoods, this was the highest risk these were the highest risk neighborhoods in one of the highest risk counties in the world. And so that's the best we could do uh, under these circumstances. Jane. I'm curious with all of that um, QBCR data, have you looked into spatial heterogeneity of the distribution of these different diseases and you're in neighborhoods but also in forests and, and anything showing up in that world? So the question is um, with the qPCR detection of the pathogens within the ticks, <clears throat> have we looked at spatial variation um, that might be underlying some of these patterns? Um, and the answer is we've begun to, but there's more left to do. And, and actually that's a great question because um, we're a little burned out and looking for sort of angles that others might think are interesting. Um, there are questions that certainly are worthy of pursuing. We have looked at spatial variation mostly in tick abundance um, at the property level as well as the neighborhood level. We've published on that um, after completing the tick project. But we've not done so much. We, we, it's, in, it's not possible for us to do that at the property level because due to sample size issues, we have to aggregate the ticks collected at the property level into the neighborhood level to ask about a prevalence rate. Um, one could, though, using um, sort of a logistic regression type of approach, ask at the individual tick level, infected or not, at a smaller spatial scale. We have not yet done that, but that's certainly a great suggestion as, as a follow-up. One more question. Um, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, you. Right, so the question was about the data on encounter rates between people and or their pets with ticks, which I told you was not affected by the, the interventions, but I didn't show you any data about that. Um, and the question was focused in on whether we could get any additional information about where they were, what they were doing um, to help us understand um, contributors to risk of encounters with ticks. Um, we, we followed up with them. Um, we, we had a survey information that allowed us to understand how much time, this was the introductory survey, how much time do they spend 
doing various different outdoor activities where in their yards and where in their neighborhoods they do those. But that's the closest that we, we got. Oh. Sorry. Um, what I was going to say, and then I'm going to let Felicia add, that perhaps we did follow up with what they were doing. Uh, um, so in the follow-up surveys, if they said in the biweekly survey, yes, we encountered a tick, part of the, the follow-up questions did ask, and Felicia might tell us what exactly it asked um, about where they were and what they were doing. So for the remote audience, um, we did, in fact, um, I misremembered, we did, in fact, ask people in follow-up surveys to give us a profile of what they had been doing and where they had been doing it in time blocks over the prior uh, two weeks leading up to that report of an encounter with a tick, but we've not yet analyzed those data. And I would just say in, um, it, that it is problematic to ask people where they think they encountered the tick because many people don't understand the behavior of these ticks um, and make mi poor judgments about where they encountered it. So oftentimes people encounter the tick in the back of their neck or under their arm, um, and they think the tick must have fallen out of a tree or been high up in the, in the brush, but that's not where the ticks go. Um, they don't fall out of trees, but they do get on you typically very low to the ground and crawl around for hours and hours or even a day before they decide where they're going to sink in their mouth parts and take a blood meal. So our judgments about where we might have been when we encountered the tick are off, often wrong. Um, so we didn't want to incorporate that bias. OK, so let's call a close to, th to the, the questions. There is a lunch um, in, in the other room. Um, and all of you are welcome, except those online who are, uh, you're welcome if you're close. Uh, to come and get a bite to eat. Thanks for your attention. I really appreciate it.